What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Monday, June 17th, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, EV slowdown steers the world further off course from net zero. Next up, Rumble in the Jungle, API, and coalition partners file lawsuit to protect American consumers from EPA's electric vehicle mandates. We fly then overseas to Sweden as they reject new power cables to Germany over market inefficiencies. We do then come and stay abroad, fly over to Australia. The world's first renewable-powered floating LMG import terminal closing in on new partners amid, quote, strong interest. Super interesting article that Stu will cover. He will then toss it over me. I will quickly cover what happened in the oil and gas markets over the weekend. We did see rig counts dropped, which continue to show a trend that has been a little bit shocking to myself. And then we've got two stories here. Total Energies sells its upstream business in Brunei. And California and Gavin Newsom issue new oil permits since May, first of a kind wow. since May 2023. So we'll give a little bit of credit where credit is due, I guess. We will cover all that and a bag of chips, guys. As always, I am Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Where do you want to begin? Hey, let's get rolling over here to this story. EV slowdown steers the world further off course from net zero. Bloomberg NEF, it's their research group over there, forecast uh, trims its sales forecast by 6.7 million battery electric vehicles for 2026. I don't know that trim is the right word, Michael. I think amputation sounds a little more like I'm not quite nope. dead yet. Holy smokes. This there's some in, interesting things in here yep. and the bareback bareback battery that's almost like build back better by Biden and have a mm. bareback battery electric vehicle forecast is not nothing there. The problem is there also is a world is a wash with lithium ion batteries. Look at China, global, Europe, U.S., and South Korea. Uh, everybody's been piling in it. But this last one here, Michael, the estimates are all negative. If we take a look, Miss Producer, can you bring up the last chart there? Lowering estimates for electric vehicle sales. Black is in the U.S., which is actually the best. Germany's in there, and it's getting totally tanked. Then Italy and the UK are like posed. It's just unbelievable. Now, but Ford, US still leads in all the in all the lower estimates. Oh yeah, but now here's the thing, Michael. Ford just canceled their big deal for high dollar expenses for dealerships on the Fords, the dealership EV lines. They can't force people uh, dealers anymore. There's not enough money to force them to do it. So Ford's even backing out of forcing their dealers to go to the EVs. Yeah, pretty pretty crazy, pretty crazy. I mean, here's the thing. I think this is what happens with a lot of new technologies. People get really, really excited about it. They make all these crazy predictions. It was really cool what Tesla was doing. You know, they seem to have a line. People liked the... You know, they like the fanciness of it. I think people also forget that Tesla also has full self-driving, which is another, you know, interesting kicker in this whole thing. It's not just that they're an electric vehicle company. They also have a legitimate self-driving vehicle capability, which is super interesting. All of these other companies seeing the rise of Tesla, kind of forgetting why Tesla rose in the first place. It wasn't because they were an EV car. It's because they were new. It's because of the full self-driving. It was a little bit of Elon. It was a little bit of everything and not just, oh, they're EVs. Everyone's going to drive exactly. an EV. That was, a, that was very little of their explosive growth. But then what does Ford and GM do? Well, they misre not misrepresent, they their, their, their team of analysts swing and miss at, well, what's, why is Tesla doing well? Again, right. we just we just talked about. It. So they they think that it's, oh, it's the EV, and they dive all in on EV. We've seen them completely, again, revise, revi you know, revise guidance downward on the number of cars. They, you know, what was it last year we saw, how much did Ford lose on EVs? Uh, it was $80,000 per car? car. Per car. So... You know, you sit back and kind of go, eh, it's just not going to just not going to happen. And in the article, they finally had to admit it, it's just pretty funny. Even the anyway, I still think hybrids are the way to go for a while. 
Let's go to the next one, Michael. The API, American Petroleum Institute, teams up with the corn farmers. Go figure this one out. API filed a lawsuit in the D.C. Court of Appeals challenging the U.S. Environmental Protector protection agency's light duty and medium duty vehicle emission standards because they're coming after it and they want all the everybody to go to ev trucks well here's a quote today we're taking action to protect american consumers u.s manufacturing workers and our nation's hard-working energy security from this intrusive government mandate api senior vice president and general counsel ryan myers said epa exceeded its congressional authority with its regulation that will eliminate most new gas cars and traditional hybrids in the, from the u.s market in less than a decade good for them yeah, I mean, he, I'm not. I, I, I guess what am I trying to say? I I, think I'm that, not all. I'm not for ethanol. I'm. I'm. I am yes. a non-ethanol fan. I, I am. Think unfortunately, a fan. ethanol has been used as a subsidy to the farmers of America, and I'm exactly. all for supporting our farmers. Don't get me wrong. I am too. Love my farmer. But, but ethanol is a direct subsidy towards them. And there, it it really throws off the entire. I don't want to say economics, but it's been so baked in now for since what was it two thousand four, two thousand three, oh, yeah. when George Bush put him in. George W. did us no favors by doing this. And you know, do I believe that ethanol is going? You know, what's this quote? Would I rather have ethanol? Farmer, than Association President Harold Wall by approving tailpipe standards that focus exclusively on electric vehicles, EPA has ignored the benefits corn ethanol plays in reducing greenhouse gap, gas emissions and combating climate change. You're almost there. You're right. almost there. Yeah. Well, he's yeah. Now, I'm glad they're fighting him because somebody's got to. You no, and I. Don't someone's got to fight bucks. him. Someone's got to fight him. And I'm glad the APA is at least involved with. It's going to be interesting to see where ethanol goes from here, though, because I think more and more people are coming to the same conclusion that you and I have is while we love the farmers and we should support our farmers in in numerous ways, directly subsidizing them via ethanol seems like an inefficient market we, reaction. Uh, to what I, we should I, be doing. We need to do something else because when we have all of these self-combusting food supply places across the U.S., which is not a conspiracy theory, when they blow up and we've had 250 food processing plants blow up since Biden took office, we're going to have some food problems and we're going to need that corn in our food supply, yep. not in our cars. Yep. No, absolutely. What's so, next? Let's go to Sweden. This one tickled me to death. Sweden rejects new power cable to Germany over market inefficiencies. The Hansa Power Bridge Project, a collaboration between grid operators, I can't even be begin to pronounce this, Svenza Kanakrat and Germany's 50 hertz aimed to facilitate the transfer of the renewable energy from the Nordics to Germany. The Nordics were the hydroelectrics. Well, they're running out of some hydro up there, so they really didn't want to do it. They backed away, and I thought it was pretty interesting because the development comes against the backdrop of Germany's broader energy strategy of shooting themselves in the foot, and the splatter got Dick Cheney. <laughs> that was a good one. That was a good one. I mean, they're waking up all around the world to the idea that energy is security, security is energy access, and people are taking the a lot of these, you know, these Central European countries are taking the the the, the India and the Modi approach, which is we got to look out for us first. Exactly. All this craziness going on, we got to we're not going to do deals now that aren't in our favor. And it shouldn't be. You should not do that. The the new gas plants, which are designed to be hydrogen convertible. Where have we heard that? Two weeks ago, you and I were talking about that on this show, talking about how that's how we're getting around our new natural gas power plants. Yeah. No. And I mean, <laughs> I, obviously, the EU needs to it, it. If we're going to be combative with Russia going forward, you're going to have to figure out another solution to get your energy that's not from. Russia. So I applaud the activity of what they're trying to do. The problem is it's always implementation. We can agree upon the solution. How do we implement that solution? Oh, yeah. Well, the first thing is get along with Russia. 
Well, but it doesn't seem like they want to. So no, and you know. then they don't want to. World's first. Let's go to the next story. World's first renewable floating LNG terminal closing in on new parameters amid strong interest. This is really pretty cool. Australian headquartered integrated energy company Venice Venice Energy is holding formal talks with multiple potential partners with ties to the U.S. and Asia to secure the future of the proposed LNG import project in South Australia, world's first floating LNG terminal, which will run on 100% renewable energy. Excuse me while I inhale. As the developer of this 300 harbor in Port Ardsdale has moved its research, I I, I saw that. I like the idea, but it's I don't see it's going to happen. Well, if you read the article, what they tell you is that this quote unquote this carbon free LNG facility. You talked about this three years ago. You said, guys, wait a second. Natural gas will at some point be considered carbon free. Well, it's exactly what they're doing here. They're using low carbon content from LNG to replace coal. So that's what they're that's how they're going renewable is going from coal to LNG, which I applaud. But I mean, but. it just there's no but it's just it, 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 it's the bait and switch that's happening. It's the bait and switch that's happening. LNG will become clean because they 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 know they need it. Oh, and it's the article that you and I read last week uh, as well too. Is it's cheaper or less impact on the environment to ship out U.S. LNG than to have somebody use coal? Yeah. Now China could care less about the environment. They want it as cheap as possible. But yes, it's. I mean, it, but it's just funny how you called this three four years ago. Hey, you know, watch out. LNG is going to be green here soon. It's the sleight of hand. It's the shell game. <laughs> it is. And now it's becoming green. All right. Hey, let's go to Total. It's up to yeah, you. Yeah. So, well, we'll let's let's quickly cover oil prices and then we'll get into to rig counts, guys. But before we do that, we got to go ahead and pay the bills here. As always, thanks for checking us out on the world's greatest website, energynewsbeat.com. All the news and analysis that you just hear is brought to you by that great website. We appreciate everybody who, who's visited us there. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy and the oil and gas business. You can hit the description below for all links to the timestamps, links to the articles as well, so you can dive in and read these all on your own. As always, dashboard.energynewsbeat.com. Check us out there, guys. Again, energynewsbeat.com. Let, let's go ahead and roll in here to, to, to overall markets, guys. I mean, Friday was 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 a little bit choppy. Not much happened, you know, on Thursday. You know, Wednesday, Thursday, we really saw the fallout from Jerome Powell coming out and, and the U.S. Fed deciding to hold interest rates fairly steady. We saw S&P 500 basically trading absolutely flat. NASDAQ up about four-tenths of a percentage point, mainly off the back of Tesla shareholders upholding two things. One, remember they were trying to claw back all of his stock from his stock grants because of the, the the shenanigans going on in Delaware. And then the shareholders also approved the new incorporation in Texas. So mainly the S&P or excuse me, the NASDAQ being driven up by Tesla there. We also saw two and 10 year yields two you know, two year yields up three up a tenth of a percentage point, 10 year yields down a half a percentage point. So a little of a dichotomy there. Dollar index up a quarter of a percentage point. We saw Bitcoin this weekend, not having a great overall week down to 66,500, but it's actually up today as we record this Sunday afternoon here on Father's Day, up about four tenths of a percentage point. Crude oil on Friday down two tenths of a percentage point, 7845 after, you know, closing up this week. We did see Brent oil only down about a, a tenth of a percentage point, 8264. Natural gas, $2.88. You know, on uh, kind of the 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 week to week view on oil, you know, we did see prices a little bit lower, as I mentioned, but but overall, we did see about a four percent week over week gain. As again, it it just comes back to demand forecasting for twenty twenty four. That's really what everybody's looking at. We've seen, you know, the EIA came out with their their revised estimates. You know, we also did see, you know, they basically what they talked about was an upgrade or an increase in their demand growth estimates for 2024. They they kicked it up a little bit over a million dollars, bringing them a little bit closer in line with what OPEC is thinking. Obviously, we know the IEA is kind of 
you know, it's they're waving their hand over on the other side, just trying to say, hey, we'll still hear, um, even though nobody's really believing them. We did see U.S. consumer sentiment on Friday drop to its seven month low. So that did that did kind of kind of weigh a little bit on what happened with prices. You know, we also did see, Miss Producer, if you can throw this up here, U.S. rig counts we did see come in minus four, 590. I mean, the rigs continue to, to, to tumble a little bit. And, and, you know, it was a really interesting, you know, one of the guys I follow on Twitter, WTI Bull, if you don't have it, if you haven't, don't follow him, he's a, he, he, He's up at he's out of Canada, so mainly a lot of the content is is Canadian EMP companies. So it's it's awesome. But he had a he had a he had a kind of a post describing the difference between you know what the Baker Huge rig count is showing, and then what you're seeing in the proprietary data. And what you're seeing oh. in the proprietary data, which is if you're following satellites, if you're following you know some of the other sourcing, you're seeing a lot of this movement quicker. And it may not it doesn't look as disastrous as. The rig counts. Yes, rig counts are going down, but our frat counts have actually spun up a little bit in terms of natural gas pricing. A lot of the rigs are slowing down while we're seeing production rise a little bit. A lot of that's due to the inventory of ducks and these, you know, TLIs as these companies have been calling them. We saw Chesapeake come out three months ago and 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 and, and, and basically say we're postponing a lot of those 30 fracks. You know, with with oil prices and get specifically natural gas prices where they are now, we're seeing a little bit of that begin to come online. So, you know, while rig counts down, we're still seeing OK movement. I mean, it eventually this stuff will catch up to us. But it was really interesting. I uh, will put a the link to the thread in the in the description below. But a really interesting look at kind of what you can see when you look at the proprietary versus the public sources. Um, you know, two articles I want to cover, Stu. You 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 mentioned this right before we started. Total Energy sells upstream business in Brunei. It 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 I mean it, it's an all gas field. Hibiscus Petroleum basically agrees to come in and buy Total Energy's a 35 or 37.5 percent stake in block B, which is about 52 miles off the coast of Brunei. Um, it was about a $260 million transaction. They are the operator. So Hibiscus now becomes the operator. Shell Deepwater also owns 35 percentage points and Brunei Exploration owns the remaining 27.5. You know, net back to Hibiscus, they're getting about 900 barrels or 9,000 barrels oil equivalent per day. So whenever you hear BOE per day, it's heavy gas because that they, they, they prefer telling you barrels versus MCF because there's a huge financial difference between natural gas and oil. It's about people right. always say it's a six to one ratio from a volume to volume. Well, it's about 20 to one when it comes to financials. So when you hear BOE or de- BOE per day, just, just, you know, a little trigger in yep. your mind saying, Hmm, I wonder what the split is between oil and natural gas, because that could do it. You know, the production rights are available and can be extended up for 15 years. So Hibiscus is going to be able to get least control this if they want between up until November 2039. Basically, what what they're attempting to do, here's a quote from them. You know, this ex, this is expected to bring the gas production share of the group's portfolio to almost 50% in line with the group's energy transition strategy of acquiring gas-weighted assets in stable regulatory jurisdictions. Notice their strat, their energy transition strategy talks nothing of returns. So, you know, we talk nothing of returns. So just let that be a warning to everybody, you know. And Total on the other side says this transaction fits with our active or with our strategy to actively manage our portfolio to monetize maturing assets and to allocate our talents to the most promising assets. Interesting. So how would you feel, Stu? Because as part of this, they also the hibiscus acquired the Total Energy employees. Okay. So how right. would you hear this? You're 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 working in Total in Brunei, and the CFO comes out and says, Yeah, we like to allocate our talents to the most promising assets, and you just got sold to another company. Consider Considering the success of Total Energy and their failures, I would be happy. I would say no, thank I know. you. I just think it's hilarious. Yeah, but, we just we didn't really care about these people. We'll let them go to another company. We're going to allocate our high quality talent to another. I mean, it's just just drips, and, and as an employee, I'd say, yay, thank you. <laughs> exactly. Get me get me to somebody that wants to drill oil. Last one here. State of California issues Kern County first oil drilling permit since May 2023. Absolutely unbelievable i'm going to read straight from the article here back in may 9th and 10th of 2024 dallas-based operator barry petroleum received permission from the california geological energy management division to drill at least 11 new wells in the midway sunset oil field near derby acres prior to that 
As I mentioned, the last four permits went to EMB Natural Resources on May 12th, 2023. Just to give you an idea, Barry applied for these permits a little more than a year ago, and they were approved over, under a 12-year-old environmental analysis covering several hundred acres of 100 wells, such as the approvals do not necessarily just the permits are coming up soon in terms of the fact that they may not actively drill these, but at least they've gotten approved and they can do that, add them a little bit to their inventory. Just to give you guys an idea, there are still over 2,700 oil field permits available. About 80% of them are still for plug and abandoning oil wells. You can't even plug wells. This is the crazy part. You can't even plug wells because you got to get an approval for that, which is kind of funny. 18% wow. are for reworks. About one third of them are for deepening existing wells. And then most of the, and then the rest of them, so about a quarter of a percentage point, are for sidetracking wells. This is a f- this is one of the few, 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 many, um, many ones. So, hey, Newsom's trying to drill some wells. Can't hurt. Well, considering they've got 34% of their power as natural gas and they are importing in their natural gas, 10% is Diablo Canyon. And now they have another problem with Diablo Canyon coming in around the corner. You can't well, buy that, this kind of entertainment in California. We know you will be all over it. What should people, I, that's about all I've got to do. What should people be worried about this week? Oh, financials. Just keep watching the news. Yeah, keep watching the news. I will be out Wednesday and Thursday. Stu will be rocking solo shows. I'm going to be down at Urtech Wednesday. So if you're down there in Urtech in Houston, come by. If you see me, say hi. I'll be banging around there with the, with uh, with some fun stuff. Stu will be holding down the solo show, so I apologize in advance for that. <laughs> but we will be back and flying next week. With that, guys, we appreciate. We're going to go ahead and let you get out of here. Start your day. For Stuart Turley, I'm Michael Tanner. We'll see you tomorrow, folks.